Welcome to Information Week's Valley View. I'm David Berlin. And I'm Fritz Nelson. We're here live in the UVM studios here in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, Fritz, it's been a busy week. It's Google I.O. week. Google I.O. is the big developer conference that Google has here in San Francisco, just around the corner from our studio here. We were over there earlier this morning. We got a chance to see the keynotes. We've got a little bit of news to share from Google I.O., some product to show some off. Some products. That's right right here in front of us. We'll show those in a minute. But first, you usually like to catch people up on what's happened since the last Valley View, which was about a month ago. So much has happened, David. And uh, let's just start with Facebook, shall we? They've been in the news. Heck, you know, really, when aren't they in the news? Flaps from privacy to a recent change in Facebook email to a miserable, a miserable IPO. They just can't catch a break. And a recent report from Comscore even says that Facebook's growth rate is slowing. So what to do? Well, CBS has announced that Ryan Seacrest is producing a reality TV show based around Draw Something, the popular Zynga game that you can play using Facebook. Now let me get this straight. Someone thought watching people play video games on their phones made for good TV? Well, color us inspired. On our next Valley View channel, you can look forward to some of the following reality TV shows, David. First, Storage Wars 2.0 an entire segment where we watch people upload photos from their phones to Dropbox and Google Drive. Or how about Ocean Beach Shore, where a bunch of entrepreneurs live together in a big house and then go out looking for venture money, wearing big gold chains and too much bad cologne. My favorite, CIO Rehab. Contestants are made to remember their roots. They have to uh, set up database partitions and configure firewalls while counselors talk them through their inevitable breakdowns. Or Protocol Whisperer. Actually makes systems interoperable, but just like the dog whisperer, it will never work on your network. How about Porn Stars? No, really, not Pawn Stars. We'll watch people watching porn on their iPhones. Or Real Text Messaging. We'll hack cell phones of celebrities and politicians, just like News Corp. At Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference two weeks ago, Apple's opening keynote got started with Siri warming up the crowd with a semi-stand-up comedy routine. In my favorite part, she asked the crowd of developers if they've been working with Google on the next version of Android. Let's take a look. Hey, have you guys been working with Ice Cream Sandwich or Jelly Bean? Who's making up these code names? Ben and Jerry? Ha, 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 ha. Good one, Siri. You're so funny. Apple then went into details about its newest desktop operating system, Mountain Lion, which succeeds Lion, which succeeded Snow Leopard, which succeeded Leopard, which succeeded Tiger. Hey, who comes up with these names? Siegfried and Roy? Apple also announced Facebook integration in iOS 6. So now you can quit Facebook and short the stock directly within any iPhone app. Oracle has been in the news lately. First, the company announced it was getting into the cloud, and then Oracle's founder and CEO, Larry Ellison, bought a Hawaiian island, Lanai. So now he's in negotiations with God to acquire some of the sky. Ellison is working on a scheme whereby the only way to get to Lanai is by SQL injection. Unlike the Oracle cloud, the hotel rooms will be multi-tenant. And it won't be expensive to stay there, but you have to pay a 22% maintenance fee on your hotel room. Now this week, we're attending Google I.O., the company's annual gathering for its developers. And it's been a busy time for such events. Only two weeks ago, we were here in San Francisco for Apple's 23rd Worldwide Developer Conference. Last week, Cisco hosted its, uh, its customer gathering, Cisco Live, and Microsoft gathered its faithful at TechEd. Last year, even Facebook held its first conference called F8. After this year's wild ride, we think Facebook might want to rename its conference. We suggest Control-Alt-Delete. These developers and user conferences have been going on forever. David, I'm sure you remember Dex Dekus or Novell's annual get-together called BrainShare. But those were the exceptions back then. Now everyone has a conference. Even Workday brought its customers together for Workday Rising. 2012. The battered research in motion holds BlackBerry World. Maybe they should consider calling it BlackBerry Fading, or an homage to Novell Brain Fart. Icon, 
Assigners of Internet Domains revealed the list of proposed new generic top-level domain names. Companies who submitted those names will have to pay $185,000 just to have their proposals evaluated. Companies proposing new top-level domains include AOL, Amazon, General Motors, Google, and Microsoft, just to name a few. Google alone seeks recognition for over 100 new top-level domains, including .blog, .cloud, .phd, .wow, and even .lol, to which Larry Ellison responded by applying for .omfg. <laughs> no truth to the rumor that RIM and Nokia applied for .doa. <laughs> Finally, Microsoft announced that it was going to be coming out with its own tablet called Surface. Design engineers have been hard at work, and they've, just to save some time, they've already made the device's screen blue. <laughs> Microsoft said it will be available at shopping malls across America in the Microsoft Store, located conveniently right beside Restoration Hardware. And that is the news, David. Okay, well, Fritz, thanks very much. Good news. So I don't know if everybody got the reference to blue. What was that about? Blue, like uh, this little orb here. Uh, or the blue screen of death. I think that's what you were talking about. Ah, right, right. Did they apply for the domain, BSOD? They should. Uh, that's a good, good idea. Well, we were at Google I.O. earlier today, and there was a lot of news coming out of there. We have some devices in front of us, but first, I wanted to get some of your key takeaways because you were the keynote watching. You were live blogging the keynote. A fantastic live blog, by the way. If you go on to informationweek.com, you'll see Fritz's blog. It was great, really well done. A lot of timed entries, a lot of photos. What were the key takeaways? Well, it's impossible to cover all of them. They jam-packed so much news into it, but there, there were probably uh, four key things. So let's start with uh, Android, new version of Android called Jelly Bean. Let's take a listen. I'd like to introduce you to our newest release. You guys ready for this? Android 4.1 Jelly Bean. Now, while voice typing works really well when you have a data connection, if you don't have one, it doesn't work. And you can actually be slow if you have a bad connection. So in Jelly Bean, we shrunk the Google Speech Recognizer that runs in our data center. <laughs> we shrunk the Google Speech Recognizer to fit on the device itself. What is the definition of robot? Robot, a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. Pretty appropriate. So what were some of the other highlights of Jelly Bean? Well, I think uh, what you saw is a little bit of what was involved in search. So they've revamped search completely, and you've got voice search. The voice search doesn't just take you to a web page. It actually plays the information back for you. Um, there was a, an enhancement called Butter, which is really kind of behind-the-scenes enhancements to the uh, rendering engine and a lot of uh, optimizations that uh, hardware manufacturers can take uh, advantage of as well. Performance of the user experience. That's less right. jittery, m very smooth animations. And, and I think one of the most interesting things that I saw was something called Google Now, which is essentially a service that allows, that, that kind of knows about you. It knows your search history. It knows uh, your map information. It knows your calendar information. And it can start to make predictive suggestions to you. If you have an appointment across town, it sends you a notification. It knows how long it's going to take you to get there. A little creepy in some ways, but uh, uh, making the phone more of a personal assistant. Very interesting that they're coming out with Jelly Bean now. Hardly any devices are running the prior OS, which is called Ice Cream Sandwich. So how long do we think it is before we're going to see a critical mass of devices with Jelly Bean on them? Do you know? Well, uh, shipping in mid-July, I'm certain that they're over there. Google I.O. right now talking to developers about uh, taking advantage of it, and I'm sure the hardware ecosystem is a part of that. Maybe it's possible that some device manufacturers will just skip Ice Cream Sandwich altogether, go directly to Jelly Bean? It very possible. Very Probable. possible. So we have in front of us here uh, a device. This is the uh, Asus Nexus 7 uh, tablet, and it's about the size of Amazon's Kindle here. And uh, there was some video. We have some video on this too, right? Yeah, let's take a listen. And today we're introducing Nexus 7. It's a beautiful 7-inch tablet. It's built. Thank you. It's built for Google Play. It's running Android 4.1 Jelly Bean. And here it is. 
1280 by 800 HD display, which is perfect for reading and watching videos in stunning clarity. Performance. Tegra 3 chipset with a quad core CPU and <laughs> wait, there's more. So Tegra 3 chipset with a quad core CPU and a 12 core GPU. That's basically 16 cores, <laughs> which makes which makes everything, including games, extremely fast and smooth. Front-facing camera, perfect for Google Plus Hangouts and video chatting. All the connectivity options you'd expect, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC. Gyroscope and accelerometer, essential for high-performance gaming. And battery, up to nine hours of video playback and up to 300 hours standby time. Now, Chris, we were fortunate enough to lay our hands on one of these devices and get it back here in time for the show. I'm holding the Asus Nexus 7 tablet in my hand, and one of the things that's uh, most interesting about it is that it launches into the Google Play interface. So what's that about? Well, I think, you know, what's interesting, we've got the Kindle Fire here, and I don't know, is it heavier, lighter? Uh, it's lighter than the Fire, for sure, yeah. And it's about half the weight of this, uh, this iPad third generation here, and, and I think... What, what's interesting is this is probably any tablet that comes out is going after the iPad, but I think the target here is the Kindle Fire. Same specs, better processing, better resolution, a little lighter, maybe a little thinner, um, but it launches... Same price, too, right? Same price. $199. But it launches right into Google Play, so it's... it's you know, making a content play, much like the Amazon Kindle and Fire, launches into the Amazon services. And just to be clear here, Google Play, when you're looking at the interface, this is where you get a hold of your content, uh, such as magazine content, movie content, and so on. So it's essentially sort of the same thing as if you had an iPad and it launched directly into the iTunes store to access content like that. Or, in this case, it's saying it's in your library, so you're, you would go into iTunes and find whatever movies or videos uh, or songs, music, audio. Books, they made a big books. deal about books. So interesting that uh, this is becoming the rich front end to a cloud that Google has built. The iOS devices, the iPhone and so on and so forth, iPad, rich front end to their cloud. Microsoft, no doubt, same thing. Amazon already doing that. It seems like we're getting to a point where you have to pick your internet, huh? That's right, and that, I think, leads us to our round friend here. Our round friend here. This is a very interesting little device, very spherical, very rubbery, and very smooth. Feels good. Uh, it's you just the, like to... I do like to touch it. I do like to touch it. It, it feels good, and um, I, may, I may have to keep it out in the, on the airplane on the way home just to play with it. It's, it I don't, we haven't quite figured out how to make it work yet because we just got it here to the set. It's called the Nexus, uh, 7, uh, Nexus, Nexus 7 Q. Q. Not right. 7, just Nexus Q. This was the Nexus 7 tablet. It's the Nexus Q. Well, let, let's hear them tell us about it. We'll come back. We brought together the power of Android and Google Play to develop the first consumer electronics product Google has ever designed and built from the ground up. We call it Nexus Q. Let's take a look. Now that you're moving into an era where devices are controlled from your phone or your tablet, we can allow people to use their devices to control their entertainment in a very simple way. Uh, it's a small Android-powered computer that's designed to live in your home. It plugs into the best speakers and TV in your house, and it's always connected to the cloud. Nexus Q tightly integrates with Google Play, so you can easily stream music and video. So here's the Nexus Q. I'm going to unplug it so we can sort of turn it around and get a view of, the, uh, of what's behind here. You can see there's a bunch of uh, interfaces. And like I said, we haven't quite figured out what they're all for. We just basically got it out of the box and plugged it in just to kind of have it here as a prop. But it uh, seems like it's competing with Apple TV, no? It's, it's Apple TV. It's using, obviously, the Google uh, Cloud and Google Play. Um, and the one big difference that I saw, and by the way, it's got USB, it's got mini HDMI, so it goes out to your television, it goes out to speaker systems, so you get music as well. Um, but the one thing that struck me was there's a social experience as well. If you came to my house, if I let you come to my house. Which you never do. And we have this in my house, and you have your Android device, you can load up your music into the experience via the queue. 
So my music, your music, other people's music, we can mix that in and play that out, your movies, uh, your content on my devices in my home. So given that you don't let me into your house, I can sneak up behind your house and hijack your entertainment system. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and that would be a sad day. Because there was no authentication. We looked at it and we, and right. we heard that they would, you didn't have to authenticate. So a little bit of a security issue maybe. Right. Don't know. We have to figure it out. All right. One more thing. Yes. Google Project Glass. Let's. Uh, this was a pretty interesting uh, Crazy way of video. announcing it. Yeah. So tell me now, who wants to see a demo of Glass? Hey, uh, we're just down here in Moscone. I got a few thousand people here. I was hoping to, uh, to maybe get that unit I lent you down here, and I thought maybe you guys could show us a fun time on the way down. So we created Glass so that you can interact with the virtual world without distracting you from the real world. So it wasn't absolutely clear what happened there for those people who weren't in the room, but what happened was the, the guys in the plane had a set of, of the glasses and they, they were skydiving out of a plane, landed on top of the Moscone Center, then some guys with mountain bikes picked up the package brought it to a guy who rappelled off the side of the Moscone Center down to the ground floor. And then these other guys picked it up with mountain bikes again and rode it right into the keynote room onto the stage and hand delivered it to Sergey Brin. That was the co-founder of Google who was talking about that. And he had interrupted Vic Gondotra, who was giving a presentation at that very moment to do this whole uh, dog and pony show. That's right. And we, and we don't have any Google Glasses. They're not giving them out. But people who attended Google I.O. will actually be able to pre-order them uh, for how much? $1,500 and they don't get them till Sometime next year. Sometime next year. So clearly they're getting developed. You had to be at the Google I.O. conference in order to pre-order them. Nobody else can pre-order them. And clearly they're looking for the developers to take the, the, the basic prototype and come up with some ideas for it to sort of inspire a whole new ecosystem around these glasses. Great. Well, that's probably all we have time for on Google I.O. Much, much more, but... Uh, a couple other guests list. coming on later who came over from Google I.O. for us. Up next, ZenPrize. Headquartered in Silicon Valley, ZenPrize is the leader in secure mobile device management. ZenPrize's extensive list of global customers and partners spans a cross-section of countries and vertical industries, including aerospace and defense, financial services, healthcare, oil and gas, legal, telecommunication, retail, entertainment, and federal, state, and local governments. ZenPrize is known for its world-class developer and support teams, highly collaborative corporate culture, and customer-first attitude. Please welcome Ahmed Dati, CMO, and Vice President of Product Marketing at ZenPrize. Ahmed, thanks very much for joining us here on Information Week's Value View. Great to have you. So, um, there are a lot of entries now in the quote-unquote MDM marketplace. We've seen a whole bunch of them. We were at Mobile World Congress earlier this year, a ton of entries in the space. What sets SEMPRISE apart? Well, I think, you know, um, the, our mission is to basically enable bring your own device. So end users have personal devices bringing the network. And we do it in a way where we don't impact the user experience, but still meet, allow IT to meet their security and compliance requirements. And when we talk about IT meeting their compliance, we're talking about people who are bringing their own devices into the office. That's right. So uh, I'm going to bring my new Asus Nexus 7 tablet here to work. There's some guy in the IT department who's going to see this thing spring up on the network, and they're going to want to lock it down so that it beca doesn't become a security risk, right? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's much worse than that. You bring it on, and most of the IT folks don't even know that you've connected it in. And you know, most of the users are just trying to be productive with their devices. I'd say the majority of users are not, don't have a malicious intent, but they'll end up doing things like, I think you, know, you started the program by talking about uploading files into Dropbox or some sort of cloud-based service because they want to be productive when they travel and they want access to documents. And lo and behold, they leave the company um, and they take those sensitive information with them. And that poses a problem from a compliance standpoint for a lot of companies. But so far, you haven't said anything that's any different from what a lot of the other competitors that do the same thing. Well, so. yeah, so I think the way we think about it is managing the device is just the beginning of, of this. Really where there's a lot of value is associated with how do you change the way business is done. So as an example, we have a customer uh, that is in the um, restaurant business. And so it's, for them, it's not about managing the devices. How do I improve 
the restaurant experience. So when you check into that restaurant, they actually have an iPad. And rather than giving you those buzzers that you know ring when your table is ready, they take your cell phone number. You can go ahead and roam around in the mall, and they'll send you an SMS message when your table is ready. They're now actually putting iPads at the table so that your kids can actually start playing with games. And all of that is being powered by Zemprez in the back end. Okay. So there's a couple parts to this. Let's talk first about the IT part, and maybe we can take a look at how, how it looks and how it works for uh, somebody in IT who has to employ MDM. Sure. So um, I'll start off with a demo, which is, is commonly the, the IT department knows that uh, people like David are bringing in devices. could be a Kindle Fire. It could be uh, iPhones and iPads. And, uh, and they're connecting to the network, and they have no visibility. So one of the things that we do is we have a dashboard. And in the bottom right-hand side of the dashboard, there's a notion of unmanaged devices. These are devices that are sneaking on your network that previously, without a product like Zenprise, you'd have no visibility on. And um, you can see a distribution that, you know, in our network, there are a lot of iOS devices connecting. There are Android devices connecting. So the very first thing that an IT person would want to do is to, to encourage the users to enroll their device into the system. And we make it really easy. In this instance, if I want to click on iOS, if I go ahead and click on the iOS segment, and I go ahead and click on Actions, I can go ahead and send an enrollment notification to all of these users. And what this will do is I can define, oops, I can define um, via SMS or, or um, just standard email what is the message that I want to send. And typically the message is click on this link and will auto-enroll your device. And, the, and these devices are known because they're trying to connect to email and things like that. That's right. So they typically, sniff them off the network. That's right. So typically people will bring it in and the very first thing that they want to do is get access to their corporate email. And so we're looking at the network connection and seeing these devices connecting in and realize that they haven't actually been managed. Gotcha. So the first thing the IT department does is they send this notification. The user literally clicks on a link. About two clicks later, their device is enrolled. They're now officially sanctioned on the network. So now what's in it for the end user other than the big stick to say, you need well, to enroll before your Before you go device. into that, before they, if they don't enroll, can you lock them out? Yes, we can. Okay. And so typically what we'll do is we'll give, or what our customers will do is we'll, they'll give the customer or the end users 30 days to enroll their device, and thereafter they're going to start locking down the network through our, our product. So when you try to connect that device a month later, um, and you just get to the latest and greatest device and you try to connect it in, it gets blocked unless you enroll. Okay, I cut you off, so go ahead with the next part. So, um, so what's in it for the end users? So one of the things that we do is when the user go ahead, goes ahead and actually enrolls their device, what we do is we provision to their device a bunch of things. So we can actually provision applications. So in this instance, if, if a user is interested in, in LinkedIn, we can auto-provision LinkedIn. Um, we've got customers that want to access applications using Citrix. We can provision that. We can also, from an IT compliance standpoint, um, auto-enable things like a passcode. We can also auto-configure their email so they're not sitting there trying to figure out what are the settings that they put in. All of that is done automatically. They enroll their device, and now all of a sudden, IT has visibility in what devices are connecting in their network. These are all the devices that have actually connected in. And in, in uh, celebration of Google I.O., I'll drill down on the Android-based devices. Do you manage Jelly Bean? Uh, we, uh, well, Jelly Bean is not officially out. Ah, but I see. We'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's connect in our network. Um, and so, um, you know, when, w when we go ahead and uh, drill down into any one of these devices, I'll go back here, um, and drill down into the Android device, I can actually, uh, as it loads up, we'll be able to see all the different devices by, uh, by OS. Let's well, say while it's loading up, I think Fritz's question is actually a relevant question, which is the mobile space is moving very quickly. There's new devices coming out all the time, new operating systems. We talked about how uh, Jelly Bean is practically uh, you know, leapfrogging ice cream sandwich, ice cream sandwich barely out. If you don't support the latest greatest, can they sneak onto the network, or do you have a way of locking down anything that's not recognized? We do, actually. So we have a, a way of locking down where IT can say, if a device is not greater than this version or less than this version, block them on the network. As a standard of policy, we have a policy within 30 days of when uh, a device manufacturer or you know an OS manufacturer releases an update, we support it. Okay. And some organizations have thousands of end users. I can't s imagine doing what you're doing here, user by user by user. That's right. Um, you, you mean in terms of being able to notify or manage them? Yeah, setting policies and yep. applying them across and that's the user base. And that's a great question. So what we end up doing is most organizations have Active Directory or some form of directory services. We integrate with it. And the, the main benefit is 
I may start off in the marketing department and decide I get bored of marketing and I want to go off and be an engineer, uh, which is probably the worst thing for our company. But if I were to go ahead and do that, um, the, the kinds of applications I would get on my mobile device as a marketing person would be very different from what I would get as an engineer. And when I get moved in the directory, corporate directory services from marketing to engineering, I don't have to re-enroll my device. Our product is smart enough to detect you've changed groups and we will automatically provision the right sets of security policies, the right sets of applications. The IT person never has to come in once they've set it up and sort of muck around with the system. Now we're, we're out of time, but we have time for maybe one more thing. You brought an iPad up here so we get to see kind of the end user side yeah, of things. So the, so the end user experience, what do they get to see? Um, one of the things that we're able to do is to securely deliver documents to an end user's device. So when you're traveling with your iPad and you want to do editing and you want to view, view information, we can. And I can have access to our corporate repository. So if I, when I click on the HR, I can see things like our holiday schedule and our direct deposit. I'm going to open this up. And it's not very sensitive information. In the very top left-hand corner, I can go ahead and do things like print this document. I can email it. I can do any of that sort of stuff. IT really doesn't care about this. However, if I were to go into the marketing repository, which is what I have access to, and I click on confidential, and I go ahead and open up that document, you'll see that we'll automatically gray out options to print, options to email. So this is what I talk about in terms of enabling the user to be productive, but also maintaining that security and compliance requirement from an IT perspective. Okay, well, Ahmed Datsu, Chief Marketing Officer with Zenprise, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, well, Information Week's own Doug Henschen had a chance earlier this week to catch up with Dr. Jim Goodnight. He's the CEO and co-founder of SAS, and they're talking all about big data. Of Information Week, and I'm here in the office of SAS in New York City to talk to CEO Dr. James Goodnight about some of the latest trends in analytics, new competition, including open source vendors, and the impact of big data. Dr. Goodnight, SAS has been in business for 36 years. Why so much interest in analytics within the last five years alone? Well, I think interest uh, in analytics in the last five years really stems from uh, a, 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 a some articles were in Harvard Business Review and then a, a, a number of books that came out. Uh, so there's been a raft of uh, books being published about the use of analytics in business. And I think that sort of woke, woke a lot of the people up in business that they really ought to be doing more with their data. So the boom in analytics has sort of coincided with growing interest in big data. What's the correlation between these two trends? Well, big data, uh, it, we're talking a lot about big data now. That's because everybody got tired of talking about the cloud. So, you know, every two years you have to move on to some new topic. And, and this uh, topic for this year and next is big data. Uh, the fact is we've been, we've been working with big data for, for many, many years. Uh, SAS is designed to handle big data. Uh, unlike the transactional systems, some of the SQL-based transaction systems, they are designed to uh, be a transaction system, fast, you know, little pieces in, little pieces out real fast. Uh, whereas an analytical system needs to have data that, 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 that you read in in big blocks. And, and you don't have to worry about all the indexing and high speed and, uh, 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 results because you're normally processing all the data. So uh, that's always been the, the way our file system has been set up to handle very large data. With growing interest in analytics, a lot more vendors are now competing in the analytic market. But what would you say is the, the difference that separates real analytics from, say, reporting and dashboarding? Yeah, dashboarding uh, using uh, what, what we call business intelligence tools. Now, business intelligence tools are really not that intelligent. Uh, they're simply doing a, a query and reporting. They're querying the database, getting results back, and displaying it. Typically, you're looking backwards. You're looking in the rearview rear mirror to see where you've been. Uh, how, how many of this did you sell yesterday? What, what, you know, what are red dresses selling this year? Uh, how many cars were sold last, last month? That's the kind of thing that business intelligence does. Analytics uses all the pa past data in the past to build models to forecast the future. So that's the big difference in, in what, what we call analytics and what the BI vendors call anal analytics. Their stuff is looking backwards, frequency, you know, bar charts, things like that. We're doing things like logistic regression to compute the uh, probability that somebody's going to default on the loan. Or we're using um, neural networks to decide whether or not a, a 
a purchase, a, a credit card purchase is being made uh, as, as, a, as fraudulent or, or not. Um, we, we do, we're helping banks compute the value at risk with, with all the investments. And this is done through uh, simulations of uh, looking at the past, simulating what could happen in the future, pricing everything that you've got at, at those future states, and then, then computing value at risk. So analytics is a lot, lot deeper than, um, uh, than you're seeing uh, with, from some of the VI vendors. You're getting very intense uh, competition from tech giants like IBM, Oracle, and SAP. Uh, as a customer, why wouldn't I want to buy from the same vendor that offers me my applications or my database? Well, because they're database vendors, why would you buy a solution from them? I mean, if you want a, if you want a real analytic vendor, you come to SAS. Uh, we support all those databases. We read every one of them. So it's not that the fact that you've got your data in Oracle or DB2 doesn't matter. We can read it just, just as good as anybody else. But they say they now offer the analytics software as well. Well, they do. They offer a, a limited set of, 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 of functionality. You just will not find the depth of functionality that you're getting with SAS. Plus now, um, you know, we have really moved into massively parallel computing uh, using uh, low cost low cost uh, grid computers and with that uh, we can we can process um, massive jobs thousand times faster than before so we are we are sort of the cutting edge of this high performance analytics thank you dr. Goodnight. this is Doug Henshin of information week here in the New York City offices of SAS talking about analytics big data open source trends I'm going to send it back to Fritz and David in the studio. Thank you, Doug. Well, great stuff from SAS and uh, Dr. Jim Goodnight. We're now here with David Crane. He's a partner with Google Ventures. And uh, David, thanks for joining us, taking the time out of your busy schedule. You were obviously probably over at Google I.O. today. We're trying to get as many people to come over, so as many Googlers, as you call yourself, to kind of come over here. And uh, we just learned while that was going uh, that you are employee number 84. Is that right? That's right. So you've been there for how long? Been at Google nearly 13 years of this. Uh this short life. And did you start off there in Google Venture? They probably didn't have a venture arm back then, right? They did not. I started when there was a handful of engineers and um, a little bit of an appetite among Larry and Sergey's conversations to hire someone with enough extroverted skills to tell the rest of the world why the world needs Google. Okay, and that was your job? That was my first job for the first 10 years so ago. You're like a PR guy. That's exactly right. All right, wow. Well, um, the homepage for Google Ventures, which is googleventures.com, says, a radically different kind of venture group. What does that mean? Microsoft has a venture group, Intel has a venture group, they all have venture groups, you have a venture group. Can it be that different? Sure. For starters, it's what motivates us. Three and a half years ago, when we spun up Google Ventures, it was very important as essentially last man in on venture, we had to distinguish ourselves and we had to do something different. So the motivation is really inspired by our aspiration to be the most hands-on most involved venture capital investor of anybody in a syndicate. When you say hands-on, what does that mean? So our team today is about 55 people. We invest in the United States only. Of those 55, just eight of us make the investment decisions. The balance of the employees are dedicated teams of engineers, product and designers, technical recruiters, marketers, and there's another layer that rides on top which we call Startup Lab, which is essentially like a small university for entrepreneurs. We are very hands-on on all of those levels, helping companies at really any juncture with technical problems, marketing problems, sales problems, hiring, etc. Is this the farm team for Google's future business objectives? It sounds like you're so hands-on, probably uh, lending a lot of help in the context of what Google is doing and what the strategic plan is. I know that other companies like Intel, Microsoft, when they make investments, they don't necessarily provide that hands-on attention, nor do they tie the companies to any specific part of Microsoft or Intel's vision for that matter. Is there a tie here? That's right. That's the most important point. The tying would be called a strategic investment decision. Google Ventures is not set up that way. We are measured by one sole criteria, which is financial return. So you could think of our structure more like the firms that you find on Sand Hill Road or you find investing in the East Coast. Financial return is what we aspire to do, and we believe we can influence that 
by working very closely with these teams on technical issues, recruiting, et cetera. Is Google I.O. a place where some of these companies that you've been working with are featuring their technologies? Yeah, we have some folks here, one called Clicker, in fact, which is a new investment that just announced this week that has a, an, a presence at I.O. We've had companies in the past, uh, one last year, in fact, called Scavenger, which had the privilege of being drafted by Google to write a, a game, a scavenger hunt, if you will, for all I.O. attendees. And this is something fun and whimsical that the, that the, the I.O. community got to do in between conference sessions. And I know uh, Clicker just kind of came out last week. They announced uh, the, kind of the, the ability to move from cloud to cloud, and, and uh, it's uh, kind of interesting why Google would be uh, involved in that. But I, I'm also curious about the size of, of the investments. What, what are the kind of ranges of investments that Google Ventures sure. makes? For starters, we have one investor, which is Google. It's a $200 million a year fund, and we write checks as small as $100,000 per investment. And we also can skew as high as 30, 40, 50 million dollars in a late stage, more growth oriented investment. So we don't tie ourselves to any regimented philosophy about when to invest and how much to invest. It can be anything across the spectrum. And what, what kind of, give us some ideas of success, success stories. You guys have been at this for a while. You mentioned a couple of companies that have just kind of come out in the last year or so, but maybe household names, ones we might have heard of. That's right. I think the first exit for the fund was a company called NG Moco, which was a gaming company founded by senior leadership and founders of Electronic Arts. These are people that, that created magic on the desktop and aspired to do the same in a mobile environment. This company was acquired by a Japanese public company called DNA um, several months after we got involved, in fact. Uh, so that was the first uh, positive financial outcome we saw. Uh, another company called HomeAway, which is uh, sort of specialists in vacation rentals. Uh, they own a number of properties, one called VRBO, which is very prop popular in the United yep. States. This company uh, filed to go public and successfully uh, su uh, achieved that outcome uh, about six months ago. And I know it's, it's painful, but Google is a company that, has, I think, learns from its failures as well. Um, can, can you talk about that process and how, you, how Google deals with that, uh, obviously ones that don't uh, provide a return? Sure. Google Ventures itself is fenced off from Google in a very deliberate way. We, we, we live in a building that's on the campus, but it's exclusively for our employees. Those insights, those lessons learned, I think primarily come from the experience. All, all eight employees. Eight employees plus the other nearly 50 that are involved okay. in helping the company. Oh, so as they're well. not from other parts of the company? Not at all. They are dedicated and local to our fund. Um, and really, the, the majority of these 55 people that are on the staff are refugees of Google. We have spent anywhere from two to three years to upwards of 10 years plus working on different pieces at Google. We kind of got the band back together again and brought, brought a number of us together that worked previously on the Google side and said, what we've learned, the, the miles that we've traveled in our various experiences at Google can then be shared with those insights given to startups and help these guys maybe avoid some of the same mistakes or capture some of the same opportunity. There's some companies out here watching this and they're saying, how do I get some of Google's money? So how do I get some of Google's money if I'm starting something up? The best way to do it, in fact, is to find yourself an introduction to one of us through the Google network. I mean, there's a sort of a casual philosophy that we have that some of the best entrepreneurs in the world probably have at least one friendship or two relationships inside of Google get their attention, they'll get our attention, and then we're happy to take a meeting if it looks like a match. Is there a way to reach you through googleventures.com or Google Plus? Back to the point about just eight people. It's really impossible <laughs> for us to keep up with email. So we're, we're the best way is to meet one of our colleagues We're going to chain you to that uh, poll <laughs> over there. There's and, a bunch uh, of people here. That's startups. right. Uh, you see a lot of companies come through. Maybe just give us a couple quick trends that you're seeing. Sure. We're seeing a ton of activity in gaming right now. Gaming at the most simple consumer level, gaming in a more complicated, massive multiplayer online gaming environment. Within those game environments, we're seeing interesting opportunities in commerce and payments and virtual goods. We're seeing a lot of opportunity in life sciences, which would be a less likely place you would think that we, we, we would be hunting for opportunities. Um, many trends that we're seeing in traditional life sciences research are moving away from labs, microscopes, petri dishes, and a lot of that work is being done computationally in the cloud. This is an area where we have deep expertise and a lot of experience and we can bring great value to these companies. Do you give any credence to the lean startup thing that people are talking about, big controversy? Sure. Lean is a forethought and everything that we prescribe to people. Uh, I think the best entrepreneurs are scrappy, they're frugal, um, and these were characteristics and attributes that I think Google leveraged very proactively as we built our company and I think we expect the same from our portfolio. 
Okay, well, David, thanks very much for joining us. You know, everybody who comes on our show gets a free Information Week Value View mug. We want to hand that to you, and hopefully you'll uh, drink out of it in good health. I will so caffeinate regularly with this. Thank you. That's right. And if you want to get the mug, you've got to get on the show. And the way to get on the show is to either contact me or Fritz. You can contact us on Twitter. He's at F. Nelson, and I am at D. Berlin, D-B-E-R-L-I-N-D. -E you can also write to us, email, that is, unlike with David here, who's too busy to get your email. We don't get enough email. And so you can write to us. We're easy to find. Go to informationweek.com. Find your way to our profile pages. Our email addresses are there. Now, David's not the only Googler we have here over from Google I.O. We also have Peter Adamtrick. He is the data lead from the Google Art Project. He's going to be joining us in a second to tell us about a big announcement that they're making at Google I.O. Great. Thanks, Jack. Awesome. Jump up. His configuration files have won Pulitzer Prizes. He just stares at a trouble ticket, and the problem goes away. Sometimes he sends emails without addresses, and they still arrive at their destination. He is the most interesting IT guy in the world. Stay connected. I got a video that'll. Okay, we're back here, and uh, I'm sitting with Peter Adamczyk. He is the data lead for the Google Art Project. He's getting a system set up right now. So, uh, Peter, thanks very much for joining us here. No, it's Thank great you to having. have you. And so, um, this uh, morning we were at the keynotes, and we were hoping to get some sense of what in the world you guys were up to at Google Art Project, because the sure. announcement has something to do with uh, Google Plus, I understand. It so. Does, uh, yes. How about giving us a sense of what it is you guys are doing? Well, first, um, just a, a few words about the Google Art Project. Um, we started about two years ago now um, with 17 museums, um, basically providing the museums with a platform to show their collections. And uh, over the past year, we've expanded to 150 museums, now in 40 different countries, about 30,000 works of art. Um, so we're now, we're now on the Google Art Project page here, yeah, looking at the collections. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to navigate. You can flip through and find a museum that you're interested in. Um, and again, it just gives you a sense of the, the kind of art that a museum has. They pick the work. They totally um, figure out the best way to represent their collection, the depth and the breadth. Um, everything from rock art to contemporary sculpture, everything in between. And so the museums are taking on the role of curating. Absolutely. It, we, we call it virtually curating their, uh, their, their artwork into this yeah. environment. Uh, and most of the museums have images online, of course. But what we do is we give high resolution images as well as gigapixel images, so very brushstroke level detail and um, incredible kind of zooms of all of the objects that the museums okay. have to offer. And there's a street view. There is a street uh, view component, yeah. yeah. So you can tour around the museum. Um, in 50 different collections, we've been able to go in and actually capture um, using the indoor uh, street view trolley. So um, show what the galleries actually look like, see the objects and spaces that they exist in, and actually give people a sense of visiting that space. Get a sense of the gallery that they're actually physically yeah, located exactly. in. Right. Um, so what we've done today, actually, is um, launched the Art Project Hangouts. And the idea there is that... Um, Hangouts is a part of Google+. Plus. Hangouts, right? exactly, is a part of Google+. Plus and uh, it's For a people way who for don't know what Hangouts are, exactly, let's yeah. only talk about that for one second. Um, Hangouts is uh, just a way for video conferencing to work really well and really easily out on the web, um, a way to make it social and um, easy to, to set up a video conference with your friends. Very ad hoc. You can just, in a Absolutely. heartbeat, invite a bunch of people to a video conference and not only see each other but collaborate on different types of content. Yeah. So Fritz and I were naturally assuming that one type of content that you might be able to collaborate on would be art. Exactly. So in this case, what we've managed to do is wrap the art project within a hangout. And the idea is that um, a museum educator or a curator would be able to start a hangout. Um, any number of people would be able to join either through the hangout directly or if it was on air, so through YouTube, live streaming over YouTube or recording it for um, future uh, reference when the curator wants to show another tour. Um, and really, uh, let me actually show the video. I think that might be the easiest way to, to give people a sense of the, of the tool itself. It looks like we're using one of my paintings. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get the audio. We're not going to get the audio? Okay. So um, basically what we're looking at is just the easiest way to set up a Hangout. You can either do it through um, Hangouts directly or from the art project. Through the share button. Through the share button, exactly. And then once you start the Hangout, 
you can share the view with what you're looking at with all the other people in the Hangout, or um, zoom into a particular piece of the painting, like in this clip, and show all of the other people what it is that you find interesting about the work. And there's the video of the people underneath that were uh, uh, collaborating, so to say, or joining yeah. the, 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 the Hangout. And the other aspect is the tour aspect, where basically you can walk people through um, a sequence of images or any of the material that's on the art project and showing them all the things that you find and the connections that you're making between the objects. So this is great. I can, um, I can date somebody in Europe if I, if I was single and take them out to a museum for a date but never actually leave my chair. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's really intimate. It's yeah, that's what a good idea. Well, that's where things are heading. <laughs> hey, <laughs> ladies. <going> David <laughs> Berlin. <laughs> Or a different museum every night of the week. Different you know? museum every night of the week. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, but again, it's it's a really simple and easy way to use Hangouts. Um, we've used just some very simple bits of the, the Hangouts API to make a really kind of uh, compelling use case for museums to be able to share and uh, get curatorial content online. What's in it for Google? Because it seems sort of very philanthropic. There's not m many commercial messages in any of this. And no, um, we certainly we don't monetize any part of the art project. There's no advertising. Uh, there's no uh, pay-to-play sort of schemes involved. It's all the museums themselves are, are interested in putting up more and more authoritative information online, and Google's providing the platform. But there's no chance the museums don't look at this and say, hey, potentially this is a way to uh, cannibalize our existing uh, revenue stream, whether that's through donations or yeah. through people just attending the museum? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, museum attendance figures, uh, what we've heard from the partners so far is they tend to go up. The more information museums put online, the more people want to go there. They actually have a better sense of what they could see if they visited the institution. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what happens when it comes to revenue streams for the museums, it's much the same. We allow the museums to link back to their own shops and their own stores. So that's where the museums make their money. So, so is this a philanthropic uh, effort? It's part of the Google Cultural Institute, um, which is involved in these kinds of nonprofit and kind of dot org uh, sort of activities. Okay. I, could, I could actually see also art students, mm -hmm. you know, sharing art with their teachers, having dialogues yeah. with their colleagues, learning new techniques, things like that. Is that is that something you guys have thought about? The, exactly. I mean, with the collections that we have now through the art project, any one institution might only give the highlights. But once you start aggregating, once you provide the platform that has as many of these artworks, you're able to tell stories across collections and across artwork themes and styles in a way that hasn't been possible. Great. Well, Peter, we would be remiss if we gave uh, your colleague David Crane a mug without giving one to you as well. So Great. we would like to present you with an official much. Information Week Value New mug. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you us. very much. Thanks for having us. All right. When we come back, Fritz will be uh, Fritz and I will be joining our audience, where we're going to not only be inviting two startups to give us their elevator pitch in terms of what it is they do to see whether or not it's something that you might use. We'll also be giving away some cool gear. We'll be right back. He has a like button. You can just imagine where it's hidden. His iPad plays Flash because he told it to. He runs big data in memory, his own. He can cool entire data centers with the touch of his hand. He is the most interesting IT guy in the world. Stay connected, my friend. You know what's really great is that guy actually works for us. How is it that we have the most interesting IT guy in the world working for our company? Well, we're the most interesting company, so uh, he has to work here. There we go. We have the most interesting people here. Well, every one of our shows, we randomly select two of the companies that have come from a fishbowl, uh, and they are startups, and we give them an opportunity to make their best elevator pitch to not only the two of us, but the people in the room, as well as many of you watching on online, and then also maybe David Crane's here, and he'll make an investment in one of them when it's all That's over. Right. So uh, we have completed our random selections. You have the, the card. This has obviously been audited by Deloitte and Touche. Who's the first uh, lucky startup to make a presentation here? John O'Connor from Just Media. So John, are you in the room somewhere? John, uh, come, come on, on up. up. All the way, you, you got to come up start, here. You got to stand, stand right here. here. You got to be in the spotlight. Your, Okay. Whoop, oh, no, no. Face that Sorry. camera there. Face, yeah. Yeah, there. There we go. These guys have uh, got the camera spotted on you. So, Just Media. What does Just Media do, John? Uh, we're a media buying and strategy agency based in the East Bay. We're about uh, 15 years old now. We started in the UK, as you can probably tell by the ridiculous accent. 
So you're not and quite a startup, but you put your name in the fishbowl, and here you are. That's right, absolutely. Okay, you game the system. That's okay with us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, obviously, they said, put your card in here, so I did. Oh, okay. I do anything I'm told. That, very well. Okay. So maybe we could get uh, some thoughts about some of the startup clients that Just Media represents. We actually do represent a few. We, we pretty much focus on the technology area, but we do work with some uh, emerging technology companies and in the green sector and the solar sector as well. Who's mm -hmm. your favorite? My favorite client? Yeah. Uh, probably you send it right now. Uh, we, work, it. we work quite a lot with them over the last year. About a year now we've been running their media campaigns. And what do they, what do, they do? Um, well, they're um, online storage. You were actually talking about them earlier on. They compete with Box. They compete with Google, uh, Google even. Uh, they compete with Dropbox, um, and they're um, they're in one of the online storage space. Okay, and and so what is it you do for them, and more specifically, because you kind of gave a little, you sure. didn't give the elevator pitch, but let's Very just get quickly. into some detail. So there, there's some other startups watching, or David sure. um, Payne decides he needs somebody like you. What is it? Well, we exactly? run med we run we do media strategy and media campaigns for these types of companies, and with Usenda, we've been running their lead gen campaigns and actually getting them uh, leads, getting them uh, demand gen, uh, getting them new prospects and new clients for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been, we primarily work for them in the online space. We're doing a lot of digital campaigns, but we also work in, in traditional media, print, um, out of home, television, radio as well. Okay, great. Sounds like they ought to be sponsoring our show. That's we right. should, actually. Yeah. So I'll have a word with my CEO. Okay. Excellent, perfect. Well, exactly. I'll tell you what, uh, how do people reach you? They can email us or go to our website, www.justmedia.com. How do they email you? What's your email address? It's J O H N O C O N N O R at justmedia.com. O R, it's too not much of a -R, O R, yeah, it's a very Irish spelling. Okay, all right, John, thanks very much. A pleasure, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. He just shook the hand with a cast on it, by the way. You're going to be okay? I'll be okay. I'll All be right. okay. All right, so uh, that was our first randomly selected non startup. We have, hopefully, we have a startup now. Well, Who's we actually have somebody who has, whose company has been on the show before and who competes with one of the companies who is here. This is Clarissa Horowitz, who is with Mobile Iron. Okay, Clarissa. Here we are. Come on up, Clarissa. All right, step right up to the microphone and the cameras here. Now I saw I saw Ojas here earlier, and he's been on our show. He did has. a little debate with uh, good technology. So you guys compete with with Zenprize. Why don't you tell us uh, what you thought of what they? We really to say. here just spying on Zenprize to see what it is they're up to. You know, on. I was. Okay, yes, okay. in fact, that was my my whole intent in coming here, and I'm not kidding. Unfortunately, I had to step out and take a call that actually took. Priorities, so you missed it. I missed it. Well, you can watch. The, you can watch the delayed I'm a terrible broadcast. Spy. You can watch the delayed broadcast, and uh, what Zenprise told us is that they have a whole bunch of secret sauce, and they're way better than anybody else in the space. So you're going to have to somehow top that in about 30 seconds. Let's hear it. Okay, so. Every global company in the world is moving their business onto mobile devices. Mm -hmm. That means they've got devices they have to keep secure and manage, they've got content, and they've got apps. They need something to manage and secure this, they need a platform, and they cannot do it with technology that they already own. They have to buy something else. Mm -hmm. Why should they buy Mobile Iron? Because we are the category leader as named by Gartner. We have delivered first to market innovations, including Selective Wipe, which is now a cornerstone of anybody's BYOD strategy. What's Selective Wipe? What does that mean? So if you've got corporate information, personal information, you're probably going to get pretty unhappy if you leave a company and all your personal information disappears at the same time as your email account and your apps. So what you're saying is, is that they can wipe out all the corporate stuff, but leave your personal stuff intact. Untouched. That exactly. seems like a rather standard part of any MDM solution these days. It was, but we delivered it first. But now that everybody else has it, what sets you apart? Because people sure. don't buy based on who delivered it first. If there's plenty of other entries in the market that already have it, then they buy based on other well, things buy, like cost. And they buy based on the track record of innovation, because what's going on right now in mobile is that things are changing so quickly mm -hmm. that nobody can keep up. And so what they need to believe is that they've got a vendor who not only has what they need now, but who can keep pace with the things that they're going to need in the future. Maybe your customer list also, it uh, helps to have good references. You've been around a little bit longer, uh, so you have some extra We do. Company. We've been selling for almost three years. We've been a company for five. We've closed $97 million in funding. We just announced a $40 million Series E round last month. We have more than 2,500 uh, 2, customers, including uh, 150 of the Fortune 500 and the Global 2000. Right. Yeah, and uh, we've done surveys, and Mobile Iron and Good Technology both show up 
uh, quite high in, uh, in, our, in our reader survey. So uh, congratulations on that. And do you guys manage Jelly Bean? devices. We do, we do, and we just announced uh, a new feature that's coming later this year, which is a way of securing Android apps without messing with the user experience, so not making people flip between personas, but doing all of the heavy lifting in the background, so that you, using your droid, can just get to any app you need, but on the background, it can only talk to the other approved enterprise apps. All right, well, Clarissa, where would it, well, before I give you the mug, where do people reach you so they can get more information? Clarissa at mobileiron.com. Cl One more time. Clarissa at mobileiron.com. I wasn't doing my job. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're on the show, so you get the mug. So Thank there you. you. Go. Thank you very much. This one will not go into the main kitchen. <laughs> this one stays on my desk. All right. All right great. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, you can get the mug, too, by showing up here at the next viewing of Information Week's Valley View. We're actually going to be taking the summer off to make some tweaks to our set and our technology. We'll be back in September when you can come on the show, come here, watch us do it, and maybe, maybe also get randomly selected. So uh, speaking of managing jelly beans, Fritz, you could probably use a little jelly bean management oh, yourself. Thank you. So I'm just going to fix that up that. for you there. Yeah. Okay, so this comes, now comes the best part of our show. Thank you very much. Okay. That's when we give away some really cool gear. We have gear to give away not only to members of our in-studio audience, but also to some of you who are watching online. Now, you've got to make sure that in order to win the gear when you're watching online, you register to watch. So the next show, like I said, is September 26th. You'll be uh, needing to register for that if you want to win some gear and watch remotely. To, to register, you go to informationweek.com slash valleyviewregister. And so we're going to start off by giving away some of the gear to our online audience. That's right. And so I'm going to come over here, and the first thing we have to give away is a Nike fuel band. Here's the box. I'm going to hold it up here, but Fritz, you've actually got it on your wrist. And what, what does this thing do? Well, this tracks your movement. So it's got uh, sensors, accelerometer, and it tracks motion, it tracks uh, all of your activity, and Take it, it off here. turns into uh, what you might call a Nike fuel score, which you can use to compare to the fuel scores of others or only yourself, benchmark yourself against uh, your own desires for activity and uh, weight loss and just being a healthy person. You can compete with other people and that inspires you to burn more calories? That's right. That's right. It would be zero for me because I never burn any calories. You were running back and forth today from Google I.O. to here, so I think you burned uh, Enough today, but other days not. Okay, so who is the lucky person to win uh, the Nike Fuel Bin? That is, uh, well, I think it says, is that? Michael Denson. No, no, that's, oh, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Juan Martin? Juan Martin. We'll go with Juan Martin or Win Martin. J-U-I-N. J-U-I-N. Okay. Nike Fuel Band. So that's that's not here in the room. That's the online audience. Oh, so yeah. It's online. You're looking around All here. Right, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here trying to figure out why is he not coming up. That's right. Too many jelly beans. Went All down, right. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, we will contact you, and we will figure out a way to get your address, and then we'll send this to you. So congratulations to you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep wearing it. You want to no, keep wearing that? We okay. better not. I'll All right. take it The off. next item we have, we have uh, we've given this away all the time, is the Kindle Fire. A lot of people love this gift, and so uh, actually the actual device is sitting over on the uh, news desk where we were comparing it to the Nexus 7, but here's the Kindle Fire box along with uh, the cabling that you need to connect it up to your big screen TV when you're downloading videos from Amazon.com. And so who is the lucky winner of this? That is Michael Denstedt. Okay. So Michael, we'll get in touch with you and uh, we'll send this off to you. Great. All right, next up we have some gear to give away in to studio. in studio members. Okay, the first thing we're going to give away is these uh, Aftershocks headphones now. Where do we spot these? I think that was at CES. We did. So um, toss this over here real quick. These are really cool headphones, and the way they work is that you put them on your head like this, and if you can see, the uh, what you would think of as being the speaker actually doesn't go over your ear. Instead, it goes over not necessarily your temple, but just in front of your ear. And the whole point of these is that when uh, you want to uh, hear what's going on, on around you, but also hear your music, it plays the audio through bone conduction. Now, what are the situations where this would come in handy? If you're a runner and you don't want to get hit by, tr by traffic that's around you, you're in a busy traffic area. If, uh, let's say, you're driving, a lot of people drive with these headphones on, they can't hear what's going on around them, well, these headphones will make it so you can hear what's going on around you, plus you can hear whether you're on your phone or listening to music. I wouldn't advise listening to music through headphones anyway, but a lot of people uh, need a hands-free headset for talking on the phone. And this actually uh, got its 
uh, got its start in a military application where the soldiers were using these and receiving commands from their commanders who are somewhere else and you need these so that you can hear what's going on around you. You can imagine the battlefield it's really important not to have something like regular headphones obstructing your what, what it is that's going on around you. So uh, the Aftershocks headphones and who does that go to? Andrew Cho. Andrew Cho. So is Andrew in the room? We have He just stepped away. All right. So uh, should we give it to somebody else? No, I'm just kidding. All right. He's still All here right. though. He's still here. Okay. All right. All right, the last thing we were going to give away, and this is another popular item that a lot of people love, and we've given a bunch of these away already, is an Apple TV. And I'm always surprised by how small the box is. So this is... It's uh, not round like the no, Nexus Q, is it? it's not like the Nexus Q, uh, but certainly a competitor to the Nexus Q based on what we know so far. Also, Roku is another competitor to this. And uh, so who's the lucky winner of the Apple TV? Well, Clarissa Horowitz. Clarissa, who already got one chance to come right here. All right, Clarissa, step right up. And uh, so you got a mug, you got an elevator pitch, and now you get an Apple TV. The best day ever. Best day ever. <laughs> best day I'm going to be back next month. Okay, all right. Congrats, Thank you. Congratulations, Clarissa. Well, there you have it, Fritz. The best day ever. We have best people ever. coming here and having the best day ever. It was so. a good day. It was. And it was a good six months. We'll be back, like I said, on September 26th. So for Information Week's Value View, I'm David Berlin. And I'm Fritz Nelson. Thanks for joining us.